Right, so we'll start now. Um, okay, let, let's look at the uh, roadmap for today uh, so that everybody will be able to follow what we are going to talk about. There are basically five uh, subjects. Can all of you hear me? I assume that uh, the system is working, right? Okay. The first part will be the listing framework under the existing listing rules. And uh, my colleague, uh, Keith, uh, will be speaking on the first uh, part and also the listing decisions. Uh, Keith has just joined our chambers, the uh, up and coming star of chambers. Part three will be the listing proceedings before the listing committee and the new listing review committee. And uh, my uh, colleague, Richard Yip, will be speaking on this topic. And finally, uh, the fourth part, judicial review, I myself will be speaking on this part uh, with uh, my pupil, Anson Wong. Uh, he will be uh, speaking on one of the cases which uh, uh, he did. And lastly, we leave some uh, time for Q&A and quiz. So uh, without, any, uh, without any further ado, let's uh, have Keith uh, speaking on the first and second part for today. Thank you very much, Hector. Um, thank you. By way of overview, we will cover the sequence of a delisting decision arising from the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. The process generally begins with the delisting, uh, the listing committee uh, ruling on a decision to cancel listing status. I will first introduce the listing committee, its setup, its reserved matters, and we will also cover the framework of said committee. Richard will take over and speak about the actual practice on the ground level in relation to the procedure of appearing at the listing committee and the listing review committee. And uh, Hector and Anson will cover the last part, which is on judicial review. Moving on to the first section on the listing committee. The listing committee is an important part of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. All powers and functions in respect of listing matters are discharged by the listing committee. This is set, cited in the rule on, on this slide. In relation specifically to cancellation, the listing committee has reserved itself the power to exercise a decision of cancellation. What this means is, the power to cancel vests solely in the listing committee and not in the listing division. You have on bullet point number three on the slide, which explains the relationship. The listing division may come to a preliminary view that a certain listed company should be delisted or have its status canceled. This is simply a recommendation. Whether the decision is actually made will be subject to scrutiny and decision-making at the listing committee level. When a party appear before the listing committee, the hearing is non-adversarial and administrative, as opposed to hearings before the listing review committee. And Richard will expand upon this point later on in the webinar. This slide um, substantiates more as to what I said in the previous slide. It further elaborates upon the role of the listing division. It elaborates upon the listing committee, endorses, modifies, varies the decision or makes its own decision in relation to one's listing status. And we have this slide here uh, for your reference. Another feature of um, the listing committee is in its precise power upon which it exercises the decision to suspend or cancel trading. And this is set out in listing rules 6.01. You have the reference here on the slide. The key emphasis in the language is that it reminds parties that the listing is always granted subject to the condition that where the exchange considers it necessary in the protection of the investor or maintenance of orderly market, it may at any time direct 
a halt or suspension in dealing in the securities or a cancellation. This language is an important reminder of the underlying policy concerns of the listing committee, namely the public interest and the well-being and maintenance of the market as a whole. This language is further repeated and, and pervades throughout the thinking of the committee as well as the listing review committee, uh, and that would be further developed in the later parts of the webinar. Generally, there are three grounds upon which that the, the committee will decide um, to cancel a listing status, and they're set out on the PowerPoint slide. The most protean concept is the third one in red, which is that the issuer or its business is no longer suitable for listing. And I'll develop on this point in the next slide. Before moving on to the next slide, there is a fourth basis, which is a new introduction in 2018, that the exchange may, at its discretion, cancel the listing after the suspension has been prolonged for a period of 18 months. This is a important feature that has been introduced into our system. Um, the correctness of this feature will also be examined at a later stage in the webinar. Suitability for listing is a question that um, transactional lawyers may be familiar with because it is a question uh, one has to answer in order to obtain listing status in the first place. It is ultimately a qualitative assessment to decide whether an applicant or an issuer is quote unquote suitable. There are, however, guidance letters on the topic and you have the reference there, which provides a non-exhaustive list and angles by which the committee will scrutinize the question of suitability. Again, returning to the question of suspension and cancellation, um, I've also set up in more detail rule 6.04 in relation to the question of suspension and halting. And generally, what this slide is addressing is the sequence of events which may unravel after a issuer's uh, trading has been suspended. And I'll comment on why this is important. It is important because normally before a cancellation decision is made, a listed issuer's trading in its shares are usually suspended as a response to certain incidents arising. And this is um, what I call the prelude to delisting. A cancellation decision does not happen overnight. The trigger event, usually something has happened, and I've listed an example. Say for an example that the listed companies has been unable to produce its financial report or complete its auditing for the financial year. That would raise considerable alarm when we recall the key language we saw in the previous slide which is the question of maintaining the public interest and order of the market. That will lead to questions being made. And in order to protect the well-being of the common investor, a decision to suspend will likely follow. What then would arise is that it would be incumbent on the listed company to satisfy uh, to the exchange that it will be able to comply with the regulatory requirements and that it will be able to um, give confidence to the market that everything is fine. So it is typically a failure to overcome suspension and meet the resumption conditions that would result in a decision to delist. And that is in just the features, power, and function of the listing committee. Now, I'll touch also briefly on this new guidance note, which I mentioned came into effect in 2018. It was put into place 
after a consultation to address a serious problem. And that problem lies in the fact that listed companies continue to stay in the state of suspension. That is, they are unable to fulfill the resumption conditions for months to months. Uh, and so the exchange has decided for once and for all to set a uh, long stop date, as it were, of 18 months. The objective is so that the delisting rules is to keep the necessary trading suspension to a minimum and to facilitate timely delisting of issuers that simply no longer meet the continuing listing criteria. Again, the underlying policy concern is clear. It is to protect and maintain this, the reputation and public interest of orderly market. And on that note, I hand over to Richard to speak on the next topic. Thank you, Keith. Right, so now I'll talk about the delisting proceedings before the listing committee and the listing review committees. Um, over the last few months, um, it seems that the stock exchange has stepped up on its um, delisting process and we have actually represented quite a few issuers on their delisting issues and appeared, both me and Hector appeared at the uh, listing review committee for the delisting hearing. Now, I'll first talk about the listing committee. That's, this, the listing committee is the primary decision-making body um, in relation to a delisting decision. Um, well, the rules governing the proceeding before the listing committee is stated in two, um, listing rule 2A.28. Um, and the key word is it can regulate its own proceed meetings. So basically, it can make its own rule and practically do whatever it like within, bound, within reasonable boundary. And the, in the recent judicial review decision of Bright Oil, it stressed that the, at this level, the, the hearing is an informal one and non-adversarial in nature. Now, so what would happen in practice if you are dealing with the listing case is that the listing division, that's the working level um, of the, within the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, they will produce a, uh, well, usually before the report, there will be a series of correspondence between the listing division and the, and the list call about the underlying issue that caused the suspension or caused the potential delisting. It can be as an ability to um, produce any report or something went wrong with one of its major transactions, etc. So there will be a serious correspondence and then usually the listing division will state um, is the resumption condition for the listed issues to comply and, and there will be a deadline. The listing division in our experience will usually entertain some time extension application but not, not a lot, not indefinitely. So once the deadline has passed, then the listing division will produce a report containing its analysis and the recommendation. The report will be given to the listing committee. Um, and in our experience, the listing committee would usually adopt the listing division's recommendation at its meeting. Now, what is notable of, um, in, re in respect of the decision-making process at the listing committee level is that the listed issuer has very little involvement or direct communication with the listed, listing committees. So what happened in, in, in the cases that we have seen is that the, um, the list code would not have a chance to see the listing division's report before um, the meeting at the listing committee. So as a result, it will not have any opportunity to comment on what has been said in the listing division's recommendation. And furthermore, the listing committee will, will usually not entertain any requests by the LISCO for oral submission at this meeting. We have seen clients that have written um, email and letters to the listing committee saying that we want to be heard. And they even went to the office of the listing committee at the, at the meeting before the meeting time, um, but they were just like kept outside. Um, so basically what you see here is that um, it is primarily an internal process within the stock exchange itself where the LISCO would have very little direct involvement in, in, in the decision-making process, saving except for the correspondence between the listed issuers and the, 
and the um, listing division during the during the suspension period. And uh, the the listing committee would make its decision um, at the meeting where they discuss the, whether to delist the a relevant issuer, and the list code would be informed of the decision a few days later after the meeting by way of a letter. Um, if the decision is that the listing will be cancelled, the, um, the listed issue will be informed so. However, one thing that um, that's a practical side of it is that um, the issuer would not immediately lose access to the Hong Kong news, HAEX news portal. And it would continue to be able to post announcements until the whole review process is over. Um, while as a matter of law, the, the, the listed issuer's um, listing status has been cancelled pursuant to the internal rules of the stock exchange. This point has some practical significance for the, list, uh, for the issuer themselves because they, they may still use this channel to issue announcement for its creditor and for its investor to know what's happening. And with some PR skills, it might be able to starve off the creditors for a while despite the fact that it has been sort of delisted already. So in essence, um, the proceedings before the listing committee is akin to an internal administrative proceedings of within stock exchange itself. And there's no or very little direct involvement by the list code, no matter how hard it tries. Now the part where the lawyers and the list code and its uh, advisors can get really involved is the proceedings before the listing review committee. Um, under the listing rule, the, the issuer can request for a review of the uh, listing committee's decision within seven business days. Um, and the listing review committee, I'll call it ILC in short, consists of 20 members. They're supposed to be independent. And usually at the panel, you'll see a lawyer, an accountant, and possibly a fund manager or bankers. And another important, very important feature is that all the review hearings of the LLC are heard de novo. It means that basically the uh, Listen Review Committee has a power and the responsibility to scrutinize all the evidence and all the submission again and make its own decision. So it cannot just blindly follow the uh, listing department's, listing division's recommendation. Another important feature is that the review process, contrary con contrast to the listing committee uh, decision process, this review process is adversarial in nature. Um, and there will be oral submissions by both sides. Now, so what happened in, on the ground is that the, the um, issuer, the list code, and the listing department uh, divisions were exchanged written submissions based on the timeline stipulated by the LLC. Um, usually they gave you a bit of around one to two months to prepare. You can ask for extension of time if necessary. And it is at this juncture that if you act for the listed company, you will finally see the recommendation report um, made by the listing division to the listing committee. Now, in my view, this is this last, like this, late disclosure of the recommendation report is not at all satisfactory, but as Anson will later elaborate, it's not very easy to challenge the, uh, the listing committee's decision. So, so you'll first have one round of uh, written submission exchange, and then, and then you'll have another round for reply, and you can ask for extension of time if necessary for both practical reason or tactical reason. Sometimes we've heard clients saying that, oh, our, our financial last, for the last financial quarter is not that good, but if you give, more, give me three more months, then I will have a much better financials and might be able to meet the resumption conditions. And given that the hearing before the listing review committee is a de novo hearing, if you can sort of remedy all the defects before the committee commences hearing, um, arguably you have a better chance of, of getting your, your company resumed listing. So you might want to consider extending your time for technical reasons. Now, at the hearing itself, uh, if you look at the listing rules, only the directors of the listed issuers 
have the right to make all represent uh, submissions at the hearing. Um, but however, according to our experience, um, the LISCO or its legal advisor can write to the LLC to request um, for permission for other professional parties to make oral submissions. Um, but you need to tell LLC why that's so, and you need to show the relevancy. And then um, the LLC will usually make its decision on whether to allow such representation at the hearing itself. So you need to bring your counsel and legal advisor along. Um, and uh, if counsel is engaged, he, uh, you may also consider to have a top-up submissions um, before a few days before the hearing so that if there's any missing points that you want to make or there's any additional material things that you want to rely on, you can use that opportunity to, to put them in. Um, and at the hearing itself, so uh, what happened is that the representative from the listing division will first make an oral submission. Usually, they would just be a, that would just be a summary of their recommendation report. Um, and then the list coast directors would be invited to make their oral submissions. And, the, and if permission has been granted for legal rep representative to speak, then the legal representative would be given an opportunity to speak as well. And then the division will have a chance to reply, and then there will be a Q&A session. In our experience, it's the, it's the Q and A session that is the that seems to be the most important part of this whole hearing exercise. Um, we've been to quite we've been to a few of the review sessions, and uh, our, my impression, and Hector will also speak about talk about his impressions, is that the committees of the LLC are seems to be open to persuasion, and they will not blindly follow the listing division's recommendation. Um, this should be contrasted with the way that the listing committee deal with such application. It seems that the listing committee would just endorse whatever the listing division says. Um, and, and the second point I want to mention is that, as I said, like there would be a lot of questioning from the committee members about the underlying issues. And usually they would like to, especially when it concerns the financial or operation of the company, they would like to hear it from the directors themselves. So it is very important for the advisors, no matter legal advisors or financial advisors of the listed company to prepare the directors for questioning by the LLC. Um, because you, you, we will all know that the bosses, they are not, they're not used to being questioned by others. It's usually them giving orders to their subordinates, right? So it's very important to prepare them for the Q&A session. Um, I would almost compare it to similar to sort of preparing an, a witness for, for court appearance. And, um, and also another point that the advisors of the listed company can consider is to engage counsel when, if there are issues that involve interpretation of the rules. Uh, for instance, we have a case where the suitability of director is in question. The relevant director has a, well, it's implicated in a bribery incident previously, and the and the stock exchange raised query on that, and and part of it is uh, our argument is that the 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 list of com the, the listing division or the uh, or the stock exchange should not even if the allegation is true should not um, use that as a only reason to ban the relevant director from um, being a director of a listed company, given that the incident happened quite a long time ago. Like every, everybody should be given a chance to reform themselves. So, so um, I'll pass the mic to Hacker for him to share his, his experience before the listing review committee. Well, uh, if, if you may uh, kindly go to 3.6. <clears throat> right, uh, if you look at uh, the relevant rules, uh, it says that a, a review hearing before the listing review committee the directors of the listed issuer may have the right to attend the hearing, obviously, to make representations and to be accompanied by one representative of each of the sponsor, authorized representatives, proposed or otherwise, the financial advisor and also the legal advisor. So uh, you may uh, advise your lay clients that well, sometimes if uh, difficult uh, legal issues are being involved, it might be advisable for them to uh, engage a legal advisor, solicitors, counsel to be there to address the listing review committee uh, on those legal issues. 
Uh, sometimes you need to ask for relaxation of one legal advisor rule, so to speak, because they normally will say, well, uh, you are a director, you are a financial advisor, that's it, and they do not allow the third person to uh, speak. Uh, we have the privilege of appearing before this listing review committee uh, with Richie and Anson Wong before. Uh, we asked for specific permissions uh, from the listing review committee to address the committee on some uh, uh, legal issues, important and difficult legal issues. We were given 10, 15 minutes to address the uh, committee on those legal issues, and they did listen to us as pointed out by uh, Richie just now. Uh, so it might be important uh, to bear in mind that uh, the directors are not there alone, uh, the financial advisors are not there alone, they can uh, have the uh, benefit of being represented by uh, legal uh, representatives to address the uh, committee if necessary. So uh, can we go back to the roadmap for today? So uh, we have uh, spoken on the first part, uh, the listing framework by Keith and also listing decisions. Richie has spoken about uh, proceedings before the listing committee and the listing review committee. Now let's look at uh, judicial review. Uh, the issues now is whether it is possible for one to go directly uh, from the review, uh, listing committee to judicial review to the court's first instance, or you must go to the listing review committee before you can do judicial review. So let's look at judicial review generally first. Uh, you will appreciate that judicial review is a two-stage procedure. You need to ask for leave. You need to ask for permissions from the court's first instance before you can apply for judicial review. If leave is granted, then you can proceed to the second stage, the substantive uh, hearing stage. So it is important to remember that you need to apply for permission, you need to apply for leave promptly. And by promptly, it means you have to do it promptly. And in any event, within three months, it doesn't mean that you got three months uh, to do it. You need to do it uh, within three months. So even if you are doing it within two months, it may be still not doing it promptly. It all depends on the circumstances of that case. Uh, there was a judgment saying that if you come to the court after one week, it's still too late for you. You are not doing this promptly. So uh, there's no limitation period as such. It is not the limitation ordinance. The rule says that you have to do it promptly and in any event within three months time. And otherwise you need to ask for extension of time and extension of time will not be lightly granted uh, by uh, in judicial review proceedings. The second important uh, hurdle or procedural requirement is the general rule that an applicant should exhaust all alternative remedies before going to court uh, seeking for judicial review. What does it mean? Let's go to the next slide. Uh, right, uh, perhaps I can talk about uh, potential grounds of judicial review first. Uh, you appreciate that normally we only have three grounds of judicial review. Uh, illegality being the first ground, and irrationality being unreasonable being the second ground, and sometimes procedural impropriety or uh, procedural unfairness being the third ground. And now we have this uh, new development about legitimate expectations or breach of constitutional rights. And the constitutional rights, which might be uh, most relevant, will be right to property. For example, you're not allowed to dispose of your shares or your property. So right to property will be another aspect of the constitutional rights, which one may want to seriously consider, especially when your listed company are being suspended from tra trading or even being delisted. So uh, these are uh, 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 potential grounds of judicial review. Obviously, it will take me one day to uh, discuss about grounds of judicial review, but these are the general topic uh, for discussion or future discussions. Right, so uh, obviously, whether potential grounds of judicial review is viable depends on uh, the reasons given by the stock exchange for the listing or for the suspensions. And also uh, the reasons given by the review uh, committee, the listing review committee, if you have applied for review. And obviously there is a, a availability of evidence to support your grounds of judicial review. So we have to bear in mind this. And uh, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about uh, whether you will be able to go directly to 
uh, the High Court without going through the listing review committee. The general rules is no, you can't do it. You need to exhaust all the available remedies, including application for review, including having a review hearing before the listing review committee, before you can go directly from uh, uh, to the court's first instance. So uh, you can't go directly from the listing uh, committee to the High Court by making application for judicial review uh, without going through the review mechanism in the uh, review listing, uh, listing review committee. However, the exceptions. So the general principle is this, as uh, laid down by the court's final appeal, uh, as early as 2006, uh, the CFA uh, held, it is well established that an applicant is gen generally required to exhaust all available alternative remedies before seeking the court's intervention by way of judicial review. It is only in extraordinary or exceptional situations that the court will allow departure from these rules. Uh, it's quite difficult uh, to ask for relaxations. Another instance is a case decided by the Court of Appeal in uh, 1995. This is the own Shine Securities uh, Company case. In this case, a firm of stockbrokers were found guilty by the discipline uh, committee. Uh, 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 however, instead of appealing to the disciplinary appeal committee, the firm went to the court's first instance uh, by commencing an application for judicial review, an application for leave to apply for judicial review. The Court of Appeal held, uh, safe in exceptional circumstances, the court will not interfere in the affairs of a body like the stock exchange. Uh, 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 those uh, subject to decent proceedings must uh, do it by way of uh, appeal if there's a right to appeal. Uh, and this is a domestic appealing, uh, appellate uh, tribunal, which should uh, be dealing with the matters. So, uh, exceptions. It's quite difficult to find exceptional circumstances by going to the court's first instance directly, but it is not impossible. Let's look at uh, the general principles. The allegation of a mere danger that these alternative uh, redress may not be sufficient, may not be able to redress the grievance, will not be entertained, will not be sufficient. If the appeal uh, mechanism is available to deal with all the alleged flaws in the original proceedings, this will weigh uh, heavily against granting of leave for judicial review. Uh, the applicant uh, may be able to show uh, to the court that well, you should intervene immediately because the appellate uh, mechanism is flawed. For example, they're going to hear your appeal only after two years or uh, they do not fix a day for you for whatever reasons which you think is wholly unreasonable. Or in very obvious case in which it is obviously that the tribunal has no jurisdiction or the proceeding were based on obvious or fundamental errors of law. Of course, the million dollar question is uh, what can uh, amount to obvious and fundamental error of law. Uh, this is subject to debate, but uh, the general principle is that it is quite difficult to go to the uh, court or first instance by making application for judicial review. We, uh, Richard and Anson and I were involved in two or three judicial review recently. And uh, Anson will explain to you uh, uh, the difficulty uh, faced by us in uh, one of the cases. He's going to uh, take you through two cases. One of them was done by us. Okay, thank you, Hector. Uh, I will go through two cases. The first is uh, Superb Summit International Group Limited. The reason for uh, referring you to these cases is that, uh, first of all, there are only very few cases relating to the listing decisions after the uh, change of framework uh, to the listing review committee. And this is, seems to be the first case which ended, ended up with a, re, uh, a, a written judgment. And in this case, uh, it concerns a report raising concerns that the company's re uh, reported revenue of uh, of uh, some seven 
hundred million dollars was likely close to zero, and the company acquired business interest in an entity for six million as a shame, and new business lines were all unsuccessful. And then a series of correspondence with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the SFC ensued. Trading was suspended. The company's resumption proposal uh, was refused. And then the stock exchange wrote to the company expressing concern that the company's shares had been suspended for more than two years and eight months. And the company has not published its financial results since the publication of the interim results for six months ended the 30th of June 2015. So it sounds uh, a, 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 a quite familiar cases uh, for, uh, for, for those listed companies which have uh, in recent years been suspended trading and it ended up in the listing decision. And in this case, the company went through the uh, listing committee stage as well as the review stage by the listing review committee. It then commenced judicial review against two decisions. The first decision is the cancellation decision by the listing committee. As, and, and the second decision is that of the listing review committee upholding the cancellation decision. And in this case, Mr. Justice Harris uh, gave judgment, refusing leave to apply for judicial review. Can we go to the next line, please? As you will see that Mr. Justice Harris refused leave to commence judicial review. And the reason for referring to this case is, first of all, there are, as I said, very few judicial review cases concerning the listing decision in, in, in after the uh, restructuring. And secondly, this case demonstrates how not to do judicial review against uh, the listing decisions. As uh, Mr. Justice Harris mentioned in the judgment, the grants for judicial review are an exercise in obfuscation, uh, which is not an easy English word. It means intentionally confusing. And I will not go through the detailed uh, arguments in this case, but I will just refer to some of the remarks in uh, Mr. Jesus Harris judgment, which shows that uh, the important foundation for any judicial review against uh, uh, the listing decision is that the there has to be some substance to back up the uh, prospect of the company to be continue to be listed or remain on the uh, stock exchange. And you will recall that there are different grants of judicial review. The, most traditional free grants are illegality, irrationality, and procedural impropriety. So apart from procedural impropriety, if you have to substantiate a grant based on illegality or uh, irrationality, you've got to have some uh, basis to support the companies, for example, its trading, its assets, uh, its uh, uh, prospect of uh, its vi the viability of its business. So in this case, uh, the complaint uh, one of the major complaints raised by the company is that uh, the listing review committee failed to take into account some relevant cons considerations. But Mr. Justice Harris uh, rejected uh, it in essence by saying that there is at, at this stage, that means at this stage even in the judicial review hearing, uh, some reason to think that a matter which was capable of affecting the decision of the listing committee and the listing review committee were required to make was not addressed by them. And so essentially, Mr. Justice Harris is saying that even at this stage of the judicial review hearing, uh, he there, there was no evidence before the courts to be satisfied that uh, even if those matters were brought before the listing committee or the listing review committee, a different conclusion would have been uh, arrived at. And the second interesting feature in this case is that uh, the company raised an alternate, alternative ground of judicial review by saying that the decision not to extend time uh, to meet the resumption uh, conditions because of the civil unrest in Hong Kong in the second half of 2019. The company alleged that this is financially unreasonable and Mr. Justice Harris commented that this grant is manifestly bad. So I don't know whether if the grant for extension of time is uh, COVID-19 would be better, but that uh, illustrates the point that a, a strict timetable 
imposed by the listing committee or listing review committee have to be complied with and there could be no legitimate no legitimate expectation that a extension of time would be granted even if there is a civil unrest or some health uh, concern. So that takes me to the second case. This is the case uh, in which I appeared uh, for the company before uh, Mr. Justice Coleman. And you will see from the this chronology, this is also a usual or a normal case. First of all, there was a suspension of trading of the company stock. The listing company canceled the listing of the company. The unusual feature in this case is that um, the company commenced judicial review proceedings right after the cancellation decision. Uh, I should not say right after it. It, it was mounted before the listing review commit, uh, committee procedure. And the company applied for a review of the listing commi committee's decision and no hearing dates of the listing review committee hearing has been fixed. But uh, Mr. Justice Coleman, in his usual effective style, directed a row of hearing and set the hearing date as uh, 14 of July 2020 of his own motion without consulting counsel's diaries. And by rule of hearing, it means uh, the leave hearing and the substantive hearing will, will, will be uh, heard at the same time. You, re you recall that the judicial review procedure is a two-stage procedure. First of all, you have to satisfy the court that uh, there is a real prospect of or a reasonably arguable or a real prospect of success. And then if the court grants leave to judicial review, it will become inter-parties. But uh, there has been a recent trend that the court uh, is inclined to direct a blow up hearing. That means both the leave and the uh, substantive hearing will be conducted at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. So in the Form 86, that means the uh, paper for commencing the judicial review proceedings, the company sought a stay pending the outcome of the review by the listing review committee. This uh, step actually followed two similar judicial review, at least two similar judicial review proceedings challenging the listing decisions. I was told that there are some more, but as far as I know, there are at least two similar judicial review proceedings which took uh, this step. In one of those cases, the court uh, differently constituted, uh, which, which was in fact uh, Mr. Justice, Justice Keith Young, and he, his lordship directed of his own motion a stay pending the listing review committee uh, procedure. In another case, the stock exchange even initiated a stay pending the listing review com uh, committee uh, procedure. So you will see that at the time when this judicial review was commenced, there was at least some reason why uh, this uh, route was taken. So the obvious reason for seeking a stay pending the listing review committee is that in the event that the listing review committee reverses the cancellation decision, there will be no need to pursue the judicial review proceedings. So you might ask, so why we have to challenge the first stage uh, 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 decision by the listing committee? The reason is that uh, there has been some grievance amongst uh, some of the uh, uh, financial uh, advisor or some listed companies that they were not treated fairly in the first stage listing committee decision because there was often a report produced by the listing uh, department recommending the listing of the company but that report was not given to the listed issuer or the company before a, deci a decision was arrived at by the listing committee so that is in breach of a fundamental principle of procedural fairness or a, a fundamental principle of uh, procedural fairness. That is the decision maker will have to give a chance uh, for, the, uh, for, for any uh, affected party or stakeholders to respond to any adverse comments made by uh, and, uh, the decision maker or that will be taken into account by the decision maker. So as a matter of procedural fairness, we feel that the uh, listing department's report, which makes a lot of adverse comments against the listed issuers, that should at least be disclosed to the 
uh, listed issuer before any decision is arrived at by the listing committee. So that is the reason why uh, uh, a few companies wish to challenge this first tier decision uh, even before the listing review committee uh, procedure is exhausted. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, you appreciate that it takes time to exhaust the, it, it, the alternative remedy of the listing review committee procedure. So as I see, there's a tension between the requirement for promptitude for challenging any decision by way of judicial review. And there's also, an, on the other hand, a requirement to first exhaust alternative remedies. So in fact, this dilemma was catered for by Order 53, Rule 41, which says that the court may adjourn the application for leave until the alternative remedy is exhausted. And this was actually referred to some of the old cases, one of which was this decided by uh, Mr. Jesus Bokhari. Uh, next slide, please. But in this case, Mr. Justice Coleman, uh, obviously his lordship uh, disagree with the procedure previously ordered by uh, Mr. Justice Keefian or, or, or previously initiated by the uh, stock exchange. So in this case, Mr. Justice Coleman refused to run any stay, uh, despite the fact that it was asked for in the form 86. In his lordship opinion, there's no requirement for making a prompt charge to a decision which itself is subject to an alternative remedy. And secondly, the decision of the listing committee will be entirely overtaken by the decision of the listing review committee, whatever that letter decision is. And the non-adversarial and administrative nature of the listing committee's process is subject to the safe safeguard of a de novo he adversarial hearing on the merits by the uh, listing review committee. And finally, there's no systemic procedural unfairness for a listed issuer to have only one round of adversarial arguments before the listing review committee. So the question is, or the uh, room for charge left open by this judgment is, whether there will be any future cases in which the unfairness is so serious that the listed, uh, the listing review committee will not be able to cure that procedural unfairness, uh, or alternatively, from a systemic uh, perspective, whether there will be widespread systemic procedural unfairness that could support a systemic charge against the practice adopted by the listing committee by not by systemic, systemically failing to disclose the report of the listing division to the listed issuer before a decision is made. The difficulty we have is that uh, there, there is a lack of evidence of such systemic procedural unfairness. Uh, this, despite the fact that uh, we might know uh, uh, that that is the case because uh, the listing committee uh, routinely will not disclose the listing uh, division's report before uh, they come to a decision of the listing. No matter how adverse the comments in the listing uh, division report is, no matter as a matter of fairness, uh, uh, whether that should have been uh, given to the listed issuer so that the listed issuer can has, have a fair chance to respond to those uh, adverse points. The, Difficulty is that there is no statistics or no uh, concrete evidence to support such a systemic procedural unfairness. So it may come to a point when the uh, uh, systemic procedural unfairness has developed to a point to, to the extent that uh, a systemic challenge could be supported by concrete evidence. For example, if some financial advisor, they have uh, their own set statistics as to uh, how unfair the first tier decision-making process in the listing committee procedure is, then that may be a better case to fight this uh, systemic challenge. So you appreciate that in this case, a special feature is that after failing the state application, the uh, company actually applied to discontinue the uh, judicial review application because of the uh, lack of evidence to support the challenge of systemic procedural unfairness. Interestingly, Mr. Justice Coleman, of his own motion, dismissed the application to discontinue 
the uh, judicial review application and proceeded to give a substantive judgment on, 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 on the challenge against the systemic procedural unfairness. And obviously, for policy reason or otherwise, Mr. Justice Coleman uh, strongly disagree with the, 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 the allegation that there is any systemic procedural unfairness. So he will, his lordship was so eager to give a substantive judgment so as to give some guidance to future cases. But, but, but as you appreciate, uh, a court of first instance judgment is not binding on a, another high court judge. So if there is a uh, better case supported by better evidence to show the systemic procedural unfairness, a further judicial review application might be considered and it might go to another judge, or even if Mr. Justice Coleman is hearing uh, this, uh, the case, if there will be evidence to support the allegation of systemic procedural unfairness, uh, his lordship could be persuaded and to change his mind. So uh, that is the sharing that, that, um, uh, based on, uh, that is based on our experience in doing uh, this category of judicial review against the listing decisions. Right. So that brings us to the end of our talk. And basically, um, practically, if your client is dealing with a de potential delisting decision, um, I think the first thing to do is to deal with the stock exchange listing divisions question seriously and try to address them um, uh, before uh, the, the, it comes to a point that they make a recommendation to the listing committee to delist the the company because that's the first line of defense and that's that's really where the the biggest area of discretion is being exercised so if you can convince the listing division that you comply with all the, the assumption conditions and your, your company is a is a good one um it will save you a lot of trouble later on so that's the first line of defense and then the second line of defense that the company will have would be at the listing review committee level where they would um i would say have a fair chance of persuading the committee member that they should not be delisted. Um, but bear in mind that you really need to get the company in shape um, before you get um, a good decision from the committee itself. Because I think our experience shows us that they are really concerned with the overall health of the company in terms of operation and financial. And, and my impression is that they actually read all the papers and, and they, they understand the, the company pretty well. So. Um, so that's the second chance you have. And if all these fails, the last remedy you have is judicial review against the um, decision of the listing review committee and possibly against the listing uh, committee. Um, for that, um, you will need to see whether there's any procedural irregularity or, as Anson mentioned, whether there's when certain reasons or legality. So that concludes our talk. And I uh, understand that for CPD purpose, we are supposed to give you a quiz. So I'll, I'll give that to you now. Um, is as long as you I understand, as long as you answer the questions, even if you don't get it right, you still get the point, right? So okay. And we will also entertain any question you you have you might have here. So you can raise your hands or you can type it, and uh, we will try to address address them. Well, it seems that you guys are still a bit shy and there's no question coming through. Um, so we'll, we'll leave. Oh, yeah, sorry. 
So we have one question. So during the listing review committee hearing, is the director able to defer all answering of the question to his legal advisor? Uh, well, the answer is no. Um, the, the legal advisor, I mean, I, I would say he can defer some of them, but, um, and if this usually is if it's just legal question, then of course they can try to defer it to the legal advisor, to counsel solicitor. Um, but our impre my impression is that uh, the committee is quite concerned with the underlying facts, right? For instance, for my case, which involved the director, which is implicated in the bribery allegation, um, the committee went at length to ask him questions about what happened at that time and into his knowledge of the relevant time. And these are questions that, um, of course, the legal representative can answer for him and have a better presentation for the answer. But um, if you want the client to look convincing and to really persuade the committee, I think the best way is for the for the director himself to address the underlying facts. Any more? Anything else to to get the CPD? Oh well, yes, that, that's all. That's yeah. all you need to do. Yeah, I got a question on whether anything else we need you need to do to get a CP point. The point, the answer is no. You just need to do the quiz, and that's that's all. We'll we'll submit the um the, the attendance list to the law society, and sh and we have already ob obtained the approval from law society for one CP point, so you get it. Right. So if um if you have but, still but, had but, any the quiz other is still yeah, this, this stuff. If you still have any other questions, feel free to send it to us by email and uh, we are happy to answer you. And uh, when COVID is over, hopefully we can have a live seminar and in, our chambers. in our chambers and see you all. Okay, so that's the end of our seminar. Thank you very much.